Efficient collateral management has been a key theme since the beginning of economic and monetary union. The ECB and the Eurosystem perform various activities in the area of collateral, ranging from the assessment of asset eligibility to the valuation and mobilization of assets. For the Eurosystem, improving the functioning of collateral markets is important for two reasons. Eurosystem is itself a large collateral receiver, so as such a, a, a significant market player uh, and uh, very much affected uh, in its core activities uh, by collateral availability. So we have an interest both as an overseer uh, of the system and in particular of market infrastructures, uh, but also as, a, uh, as an actor, as a, as a significant market player. The Eurosystem has set up the correspondent central banking model to ensure efficient cross-border mobilization of collateral. The CCBM enables all counterparties to mobilize assets eligible for use in Eurosystem monetary policy operations and for intraday credit in Target 2. It operates regardless of the location of the counterparty or the assets. The CCBM has proved to be the most effective tool for delivering cross-border collateral to the Eurosystem central banks. To keep pace with the growing demand for collateral and the need for more sophisticated facilities to support collateral delivery and the secured money market, the Eurosystem is continuously reviewing and enhancing its collateral services. For instance, in 2014, it will introduce cross-border tri-party services and eliminate the repatriation requirement. These moves will allow for a more efficient use and management of collateral assets, both in Eurosystem operations and at market level. With the same objective in mind, the ECB guides the work of Kojezi, the ECB contact group on Euro securities infrastructures. This group brings together representatives from the Euro system, market infrastructures and market participants. They consider developments of common interest in the Euro securities settlement industry, including in the area of collateral. A Kojezi report, published in July 2013, analyzes collateral eligibility requirements across central bank frameworks, regulatory requirements and the practices of central counterparties. The report aims to increase transparency and improve understanding of the different collateral requirements faced by the financial industry. As for collateral mobility, an important milestone within the Euro repo market was reached in July 2013. After lengthy negotiations and with the active support of the ECB, key market participants signed a Memorandum of Understanding on Tri-Party Settlement Interoperability TSI. It's the result of three years' work by the European Repo Council, a central counterparty, central securities depositories and others. TSI aims to facilitate movements of collateral between settlement locations in Europe and to bring borrowers and lenders together more efficiently regardless of where their underlying liquidity or collateral is held. As the collateralized money market evolves, the Eurosystem will continue to monitor and enhance its own services and work with the market to bring about a more unified Euro area financial market. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you here this morning to the Eurosystem panel session, and I'm very honored to introduce to you uh, Mr. Benoit Carré, member of the executive board of the ECB and newly appointed chair of the Basel Committee on Payments and Settlement Systems, who will provide the opening remarks to this morning's panel session. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fiona. And um, before, uh, before um, moving to the substantial remarks, I would first and foremost I'd like to, uh, to thank very much all the organizing teams uh, for this uh, session and more generally uh, for the uh, Eurosystem participation in, uh, in Cybos. And that's a lot of work that you don't see, <laughs> but it's there. So thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to, uh, to open today's uh, Eurosystem session uh, in front of, a, uh, uh, of such an international audience of market professionals 
the uh, euro system, as you know, comprises the European Central Bank uh, and the uh, 17 participating uh, national central banks um, for those countries that have uh, adopted the euro. And uh, we, uh, we highly value the opportunity uh, that uh, Cybos uh, provides uh, to discuss um, with you uh, our main initiatives uh, concerning market infrastructures. Uh, the Euro system uh, has a, a stand in Cybos uh, well, for several years now. We've had, we've had our own stand in Cybos, uh, and this year it's number G61, for those of you who haven't been there. Uh, and uh, we participate as speakers uh, collectively uh, in various events. Why does the Euro system have a, uh, has an interest in, a, um, in an efficient and sound uh, financial system? I would, see, uh, I would see two reasons that uh, certainly uh, the panel participants will discuss this morning. First, um, it is a prerequisite for a smooth uh, and balanced uh, transmission of monetary policy, and we are our central bank. We are the central bank of issue of the euro. We need a, a well-functioning market infrastructure uh, for the smooth implementation of monetary policy. And, and let me, by the way, or en passant, as, uh, as uh, Jean-Claude Trichet would have said, uh, let me en passant uh, mention that uh, through the crisis that the Eurozone has been facing uh, since 2010, uh, many, uh, many um, um, improvements, uh, possible improvements to the functioning of the single currency area have been identified. But something that has not failed, something that has proven uh, robust and efficient, is um, uh, market infrastructures in the euro area, and in particular payment systems uh, in the euro area. Uh, this has never been affected by the crisis. So uh, we, uh, this, is a, uh, this is an asset on which we can build, and we are committed to, uh, to further improving uh, and, uh, and uh, taking forward uh, our market infrastructures. And of course, the second reason is that market infrastructures are important for uh, financial stability. So, uh, in the context of the euro area, uh, achieving uh, efficiency uh, will require further progress uh, towards reducing uh, fragmentation of the financial market infra infrastructure. Um, while almost full integration has been achieved uh, in the large value payment uh, segment, and uh, I will mention Target 2 in a, in a moment, the, uh, the security settlement uh, and also the retail payment uh, segments uh, remain uh, fragmented within the euro area. So a key objective of the euro system is to uh, overcome uh, such fragmentation, uh, which would also contribute to uh, the objective we have in Europe to uh, support the completion of the, uh, of the EU single market. So for a smoothly functioning single market for goods and services, uh, we need a, an integrated uh, market infrastructure, and we need a more integrated uh, security settlement and a more integrated uh, market for retail uh, payments. And we are committed to, achieve, to achieving that. So a, a large number of important uh, developments uh, affecting the integrity uh, and the safety uh, of uh, European financial market infrastructures uh, are currently taking place at the market level, and I'm quite sure that these also will be discussed uh, in, the, in the panel. And today I would like to uh, draw your attention to uh, what I believe is very significant, um, the contribution that the euro system itself uh, is making to those objectives. And then we'll, we'll listen to the market participants, uh, of course, uh, uh, who have a lot to bring. But uh, let me focus on what we at, in the euro system have to, uh, to, um, uh, to put on the table. So first, uh, in its uh, oversight and policy functions, uh, the euro system actively contributes to strengthening the, the regulatory framework uh, for the financial system. And here I refer to the new uh, CPSSIO score uh, principles uh, for financial market infrastructures, PFMIs, uh, that set common standards for, uh, for CCPs, uh, CSDs, uh, SSS, security settlement systems, uh, trade repositories, uh, and uh, systemically uh, important uh, payment systems. So uh, just to give you an example, the editorial team that drafted the, the PFMI report uh, was uh, co-chaired uh, by uh, my ECB colleague, Daniela Russo, who's here, uh, and who spoke on Monday afternoon uh, on, this, uh, on this very matter. Um, I consider the PFMIs uh, to be key for aligning uh, European and international standards, and, and hence uh, ensuring a global consistency uh, in the operation of infrastructures, and a level playing field, uh, avoiding uh, local uh, competitive disadvantages. Um, effective implementation of the PFMIs at a global level is a significant challenge and uh, will uh, uh, absorb a significant uh, uh, fraction of the, of the resources and time of the, uh, 
uh, Basel Committee on Payment and Settlement Systems, the, the CPSS, um, uh, which uh, I will, uh, I will uh, be uh, honored to chair uh, starting in October. So uh, implementation of the PFMI will be a major task for the, uh, for the CPSS. Um, and, and Europe as a, as a region uh, and as a, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a space of law, if I may say, uh, is very committed to the implementation of the, of the PFMI, in particular through EMIR, uh, which is fully consistent with the, with the PFMIs. Um, so the Euro system itself uh, intends to enforce the, the PFMIs uh, in the following ways. Well, first, for systemically important payment systems, uh, the ECB uh, will enforce the PFMIs by means of an ECB regulation. Uh, which was submitted for public consultation before the summer, so it's still time to, uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to assess and uh, review the comments that we uh, received. So we are, re we are in that process of, uh, of reviewing the comments received to the consultation. For CCPs, uh, the Euro system will rely uh, on EMIR, uh, the European Market Infrastructure Regulation, which, as you know, uh, also provides for mandatory central clearing and reporting to uh, trade repositories and uh, of, uh, of OTC derivatives. Um, so, um, uh, delivering on the, uh, on the G20 and the NFSB uh, commitments as regards central clearing and OTC derivatives. For CSDs, uh, the Euro system uh, intends to rely on the CSD regulation, which is currently in preparation. So that was for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for our role as, a, as policy maker and, and regulator. Um, second, uh, the Euro system also has a role as a catalyst. Uh, we support uh, the, the single Euro payment area, the SEPA, uh, with a view to, in, to integrating uh, the market for Euro retail payments. Um, and uh, eliminating the differences between cross-border and national payments. So I will not go into the details of, of the SEPA, um, and I would just like to invite you uh, to, to join us uh, at the dedicated open theater session uh, later today at 2.45 p.m. on the SEPA, the single uh, euro payment area. Third, uh, the euro system is also an operator. Um, so we own and operate uh, the, uh, the real-time growth settlement system, uh, Target 2. Uh, Target 2 is considered a major achievement in uh, integrating the market for real-time euro payments uh, and settlements in central bank uh, money. Uh, Target 2 offers uh, harmonized services uh, with a single price structure across the entire euro area, even beyond the euro area, actually. Uh, it's used by uh, over 1,000 banks directly, uh, while around 57,000 banks, including branches and subsidiaries, uh, are addressable. Over 80 other financial market infrastructures uh, in the form of uh, ancillary payment systems, <coughs> security settlement systems, or CCPs, uh, participate in, uh, in Target 2 uh, to uh, settle in central bank money uh, using six uh, harmonized settlement models. Um, now, moving beyond Target 2 and with a view to, to overcoming fragmentation and inefficiencies uh, in the security settlement uh, layer uh, of, uh, of our post-trading landscape, uh, the Euro system launched the uh, Target 2 Securities, uh, the T2S initiative, uh, in 2008. Um, T2S is a major infrastructure project uh, scheduled to uh, go live in 2015, and we very much intend to be on time in 2015. Uh, we will be in, on time which will bring substantial benefits to the European post-trading industry by providing a centralized service uh, for security settlement in uh, central bank money. Um, the service will be offered at low cost, uh, irrespective of whether transactions are domestic or uh, cross-border. And moreover, T2S will greatly facilitate the movement of collateral, uh, in particular uh, uh, on the cross-border level. And this is of particular relevance uh, in the view of the increasing demand uh, for uh, collateral in the market. T2S will also help liquidity management by offering specific services such as harmonized uh, auto-collateralization, uh, which uh, today uh, exists in only in a few European countries. T2S will foster competition uh, in the securities market and uh, will support the establishment uh, of a single market for security services. Um, with T2S, there will be a single set of rules, uh, standards, tariffs for all transactions across Europe. And furthermore, uh, T2S is driving forward a long list of uh, post-trade harmonization uh, initiatives. And tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. in this room, uh, we'll be, um, we will host a Eurosystem session uh, dedicated to, uh, to T2S. 
Uh, in the area of collateral management services, you will recall that in 1999, uh, the Eurosystem implemented the correspondent uh, central banking model, the CCBM, which was mentioned in the short film that you've seen at the moment. Um, the CCBM supports integration by ensuring that all assets eligible for use in Eurosystem uh, monetary policy operations are available uh, to Eurosystem counterparties irrespective of uh, where uh, in the euro area an asset or a counterparty uh, is located. And as you saw in the, in the film, the uh, euro system is continuously assessing and improving uh, its own policies and services uh, in the field of collateral management. And in this context, uh, I am today pleased to announce uh, on behalf of the euro system uh, the dates uh, in 2014 on which two uh, major enhancements uh, in this field uh, will go live. The first of this announcement uh, is the removal of the repatriation requirement uh, from the CCBM, which is scheduled for May 2014. So Eurosystem counterparties will no longer be required when borrowing liquidity from the Eurosystem to move their collateral from the investor CSD uh, to the issuer CSD. This will allow counterparties to manage their collateral holdings uh, in a more flexible and cost-efficient manner, and uh, it will pave the way for the second uh, Eurosystem collateral management announcement, uh, which is the support of cross-border tri-party collateral management services. So this is the second date. Uh, the Eurosystem will go live uh, with this change, uh, the, so the support of cross-border uh, tri-party collateral management services uh, in September 14 thereby making tri-party services uh, equally available to all euro area counterparties for use in euro system credit operations. Uh, in practice, uh, it will allow counterparties to use tri-party services offered by an agent in another country. And this euro system initiative is another way to in in enable counterparties to manage collateral assets more efficiently. It's also more important uh, in the current environment uh, in view of the challenges uh, associated with increasing demand for collateral assets uh, due to both uh, regulatory and uh, market uh, developments. So these are two uh, major uh, steps forward uh, for the, the CCBM that both will uh, take place in 2014 and now we have dates. Finally, I will take a moment to mention changes in the area of your system user assessment uh, that will be introduced before the end of this year. During the coming weeks, uh, the Eurosystem will finalize a new framework for conducting the assessment of security settlement systems and uh, link arrangements uh, to determine the eligibility for use in Eurosystem uh, credit operations. This new framework is based on a two-layer approach. Uh, the first layer uh, will look at the outcome of uh, oversight assessment, and uh, the second layer will uh, focus on a limited number of concerns and risks uh, specific to the Eurosystem uh, user perspective. This new and more streamlined uh, user assessment framework introduces uh, considerable procedural simplifications that will support in particular the assessment to be carried out in the future 42S as uh, the number of links established between security settlement systems is expected to increase uh, greatly with the implementation of T2S uh, as a pan-European uh, settlement uh, platform. So this will be uh, streamlined and, um, um, and faster. Having briefly shared with you uh, these observations on the role of the euro system in integrating uh, European financial market infrastructures, uh, as well as on euro system initi initiatives uh, in the area of collateral management uh, and, use and user assessment uh, to support financial market integration, uh, I will leave you to enjoy the panel discussion, uh, which will focus explicitly on uh, challenges and opportunities for the integration uh, of European financial market infrastructures. Um, I am sure that we, uh, we meaning the Eurosystem and the financial market industry, so all, all of us in this room, uh, are firmly shaping an integrated uh, European financial market infrastructure landscape. So to open the, uh, the panel discussion today, I would like to give the floor to uh, Daniela Russo, who is Director General for Payment uh, and Market Infrastructure uh, at the ECB, and who is also Chair of the Euro Euro European System of uh, Central Bank Payment and Settlement System uh, Committee, the PSSC. Daniela will be uh, chairing the session, so you're in good hands. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you will enjoy the discussion, and I hope very much the discussion will be lively and maybe a little bit controversial to uh, keep us uh, awake this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, 
Dr. Benoit. If I can start with something personal, you may have noticed that today I'm uh, wearing on purpose the same dresses in the video, just to show consistency of central banks. <laughs> but the necklace is different because central banks should not be 100% uh, predictable in order to avoid moral hazard. <laughs> So with this uh, introduction, I would like now, uh, uh, Benoit has provided to you the overview on what is the situation where this panel has to be uh, put. On the one hand, there are a number of regulatory reforms that uh, have been put in place and are continuing to be put in place. And on the other hand, there are a number of initiatives, including a European initiative that help in addressing the concern that may come either for the implementation of the reforms or because of uh, the recent crisis. And so in this respect, uh, the great challenges are probably under the area of collateral because on the one hand, also the new regulation is pushing and is pushing hard for increasing the level of collateralization of exposures, not only exposure at the infrastructure, but also bilateral exposures of the banks. And on the other end, because the recent crisis has proved that in extreme stress, the situation, the uncollateralized money market may not work. And so as a consequence, having an effective repo market that works and being collateralized possibly is more resilient and is more exposed to hoarding behavior can be something that, of course, is desirable. So in this framework, there are some important challenges, but also opportunities for the industry. So the idea is that we will ask some representative of the industry, first the provider to express their view, but then we will ask also banks to react. For this reason, we have in the panel Paul Simon of Euroclear. I don't think I need to introduce Paul. We have Sophie Gauthier from BNP Paribas, same for Sophie. Matthias Papenfuss from Clearstream Banking Germany, and then Gerhard Hartzink, that has several roles, so I will not know how to label you, but I think he's very well known. I also would like just to say that because both Paul and Matthias are not only representative of Euroclear Clearstream, but also very active in EXDA, so we may expect that maybe sometime you will give remarks that go beyond the interest of the institution, if not, uh, just clarify. So I suggest that uh, I will start with uh, Paul and Matthias, and what I would like to, to ask you is, what are, in your view, the main challenges and uh, the main opportunities for infrastructure? Thank you, Daniela. Uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, still delighted, delighted to be here. I, I want to just to take a very high level sort of opening, opening view and, and summarize sort of the challenges that infrastructures, CSDs in my case, have in sort of three broad categories, and they, they won't surprise you. I mean, the first one is, is, is regulatory challenges. Um, we as infrastructures are no different from you as market participants. You know, we are being hit by a range of different principles and standards to comply with, a range of different regulations as well. And in relation to the regulations, I would say don't think, for those of you who are European or who interact with European infrastructure, that something like the CSD regulation is entirely internal to CSDs. It isn't. There's an awful lot in there which actually affects market structure. Um, we've heard a lot in the last couple of days about T plus 2. I won't comment on that. But particularly in relation to settlement discipline, where the EU is intending to ensure that you know, basically any fail of any transaction in any security could potentially be subject to a, a settlement fine uh, is going to be a huge challenge for CSDs to implement, but also a huge challenge for the market to implement and to be able to pass it on to their clients. So we have regulatory challenges. Um, uh, we also have issues of resolution and recovery. How do CSDs recover from a financial crisis, is it right that all CSDs should have loss allocation? If not, how do they manage? Um, and then we also have, of course, the, the IT challenges of dealing with connecting to T2S, of dealing with settlement discipline, etc. The third category that I'd bring up is the, is the business challenge. And the business challenge here, I think, for CSDs it is not about how the regulatory environment affects us. It's not how the collateral changes um, uh, of the Euro system in terms of removing the repatriation requirement, introducing tripartite interoperability, how that affects us directly. It's how it affects our clients. And in particular, in relation to uh, the, the sort of tsunami of regulation that you have all been experiencing globally, how, do we really understand as infrastructures how those regulatory changes that affect 
our clients and not us actually are going to change the way in which you bring business to infrastructure? Do we understand the details of, of Basel III, of CRD4? Do we know what the net stable funding ratio or the leverage ratio is going to do to our clients' business and how it's going to change the way in which they interact with us? That, from our perspective, is probably our, our biggest challenge and our biggest uh, unanswered question. Uh, it's, a, it's a known unknown, if you like, to use uh, an oft-quoted phrase. Finally, I, I, I would comment on a sort of note of optimism. One thing that is interesting from what's been going on globally from uh, regulators is that they are entrusting more and more business to infrastructures. We've obviously seen that with CCPs, uh, and I'm not here to comment on, on the sort of CCP structures, but we've seen more and more business of standardized derivatives contracts being forced through CCPs. But we're also seeing it in Europe with CSDs. We're seeing people be encouraged to hold their collateral only with a CSD. We're seeing changes to the way in which liability structures in the, in the hedge fund industry are, are changing in relation to people who directly deposit with an SSS or a CSD. So we're seeing actually more business being brought to settlement systems. And that gives us a huge responsibility of being able to deliver services, and we'll comment on collateral later, which actually deliver low-risk, highly efficient, you know, low-cost services um, to our clients. So that's my sort of introduction, da Daniela. There's a lot of challenges, but there are also significant opportunities given the way in which regulators are entrusting us with more and more business. Thank you, Paul. Matthias? Uh, <clears throat> good morning, first of all. And um, I think it's, it's a very quick introduction looking into the same business and, and similar business activities that we're performing uh, from, from a CSD slash ICSD point of view, uh, you will not be surprised that I'm not coming up with different challenges, but maybe the emphasis on the challenges is slightly different than what, what Paul had introduced to us. Um, when we look into the market changes and the market infrastructure changes, uh, specifically I think the, the emphasis here from a European point of view is on T2S. Adapting and changing business models for CSDs is, I believe, the key element which is lying ahead of us. And, and not just from a settlement space, but also looking into other areas. How does it impact asset services, etc.? So what kind of solutions you're providing in that new infrastructure that is coming up uh, for these type of business activities and services? But also at the same point in time, not just looking at it of being threatened by new infrastructure activities or these kind of major projects, but exploring business opportunities and leveraging business opportunities resulting out of it. Um, and that is primarily uh, lying in the area of collateral, which has been highlighted as one of the key elements and key themes uh, in, in the introductory remarks already. So um, being able to utilize collateral effectively, moving it around, specifically in Europe, will become much easier in an environment where T2S is available. Um, but we should not fool ourselves by just focusing on Europe in this context, because collateral is global. And there's just one, let's call it regional solution then for Europe coming up. But we have to solve the collateral question also on a global scale. And subsequently, we need to come up with effective solutions for optimizing collaterals globally as well. Um, when it comes down to the sourcing of collateral, the uh, allocation of collateral in an effective way, et cetera. Um, but third, there is also in these infrastructure work a, a huge potential when it comes down to market practices. So harmonization of procedures, of processes, at least within the scope of Europe, is, is one of the key elements as well that is, uh, that is enabled by this market infrastructure work. And uh, I think there is quite some progress in terms of defining how harmonization should look like. But it's now the call also to deliver effectively that harmonization is actually taking place. And this is from an infrastructure point of view, but also from a market participant point of view, I believe the key element that is lying ahead of us. Make it happen is, I would say, so it's a very short version, whether it's about a T plus two settlement cycles, whether it's about harmonizing on corporate action areas, whether it's calling about the public sector in order to do something on taxation or at least on tax procedures, uh, there are quite some elements uh, still on the roadmap which have to be defined and uh, which will contribute to a much better and harmonized way of processing in Europe. Uh, the second layer is regulation, regulatory environments, CSDR, 
CSD regulation is, is, is the key element when it comes down to market infrastructures in two dimensions, creating a level playing field between CSDs on the one hand, but also delivering a certain level of harmonization uh, in the settlement area. Having CPS IOSCO principles being effective from financial market infrastructures, um, looking into recovery and resolution plans, some of the themes that, that Paul has mentioned. Besides, I would say, level playing field when it comes down to CSD regulation, the other elements are transparency and consistency, because regulation is happening on a global level, on a regional level, if you look at it from an EU perspective, but even on a local level in each individual domestic market, and making sure that all these regulatory initiatives are consistent with each other and not deviating too much, not offering regulatory arbitrage opportunities in one or the other direction is one of the key areas uh, that, that still has to be worked on because the current environment is still pretty much fragmented when we look into the different concepts. And last but not least, it's about the solution for the magic triangle. Um, it has been mentioned how to transform all these things into something tangible for our customers, for the market participants. But I call it the magic triangle in a sense of regulatory intervention on the one hand, which is looking into safety, risk reduction, but also maybe creating fragmentation to a certain extent. On the other side, customers are looking into efficiency and cost reduction. And at the same point in time, also into service innovation. And these are three angles, three cornerstones, which are not automatically aligned. And, and the key question is, how can we provide solutions uh, for our customers in this environment? Thank you. So let's see how Sophie reacts on this. <laughs> Good morning, Daniela. Good morning to, to you all. It's a pleasure to, uh, to contribute to this discussion this morning. As, as you understand, I come from the perspective of, um, of a service provider who is uh, basically supporting a very broad range of clients investing um, globally and, 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 and particularly throughout Europe. So our, you know, most of our clients, I would, I would argue, actually are very remote from uh, market infrastructures. You know, they're asset managers, uh, institutional investors, and broker dealers, um, banks who actually uh, somehow want to shy away from the complexity of, uh, of such infrastructure, but also be able to invest in a very broad range of, uh, of assets. So here we're not talking just about equities, bonds, uh, but definitely also funds, uh, and derivatives, um, real estate, um, you name it. So um, in, in that perspective, obviously, we come as a major participant to, uh, to infrastructures. Um, just to give you a, a sense of proportion, uh, we are a member of more than 41 derivative CCPs, 23, uh, sorry, equity, equity CCPs, 23 derivatives CCPs, and more than 31 CSDs. So we connect to where our clients you know, need basically to invest, and in, in that sense, being able to, to manage more than 90% of the assets which uh, our clients safe keep directly. So I would discuss based on your question, mainly two, two, two questions. The first one is integration, and the second one is, yes, the impact of regulation, which uh, both Paul and Matthias have touched on. Integration, well, when you look at the question on the panel, I would argue what, what integration have we seen so far? Um, and the reality that um, market forces have brought more uh, diversification and uh, you know, uh, development of new infrastructure more than actual integration. Um, I think that's been promoted largely by the European directives. If you look at MIFID, which has been pushing for more uh, trading venues, uh, you look at EMIR today, which is going probably to, to create more trade repositories, uh, new venues into uh, OTC clearing, and uh, the odds are out for the impact of CSDR. Are we going to see more uh, central securities depositories uh, entering the, the market? So. The Commission actually has been pushing for competition, and the market has been integrating vertically, uh, pretty much under the governance of exchanges, and focusing increasingly on uh, derivatives clearing. So I would say that these initiatives have not pushed too much towards um, integration altogether. And actually, the, the key initiative towards integration has, has not come from market forces or, or regulation, but very much from the ECB initiative itself, moving into uh, uh, integrating and harmonizing settlements through uh, the Target 2 Securities uh, uh, initiative. 
So we, we should very much uh, you know, praise the, uh, the ECB for, for taking such a step. As a participant, what we are doing uh, with regards to target two securities is uh, three-pronged. We've been very much involved since 2006 in participating in all the working groups and actually making sure that uh, the harmonization which is brought about by T2S comes, comes to life. So we've been a very active participant in this debate. We are also making sure that uh, uh, we will take the best of T2S to make sure that our clients benefit. Um, and in example being, uh, you know, pa partial allocation, pa partial settlements, uh, auto collateralization, which, uh, as, as was mentioned, uh, has been already practiced in some markets and now will become the norm. Uh, t, t plus two settlement deadlines and so forth. So we are really making sure that we will benefit the most from target two securities to, to support settlement efficiency for our clients, um, helping them to, to settle out of one central uh, securities and cash account if they wish so. Um, but I would mention that we are already able to do this on a, on a small scale basis uh, on the French, Belgium and, and Netherlands markets because that's already the way we, we operate within the, the Euroclear group. Uh, so we have already seen you know, clients taking advantage of such uh, solutions. And finally, adapting to what our clients are requesting uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, separating asset servicing from, from settlement, sponsoring their access to target two securities, and basically providing flexibility uh, really to answer what, what our clients will, uh, will desire. So I see we've been, a, you know, a strong participant in, the, in, in this evolution, very, very much supporting, you know, the integration and harmonization brought by T2S, and operating actually out of a central platform and also an international uh, operating center, which is, uh, which is based out of Lisbon, so that we can deliver also cost efficiency on, on the basis of T2S. Now, moving on to regulation, obviously that uh, I would also put it on the, uh, on the motto of challenges and opportunities. Uh, the first one being EMIR. I mean, EMIR, yes, is pushing forward to uh, more collateral, collateralization of OTC trades. And we've seen our clients coming with requests to provide access to OTC you know, central counterparties. Interestingly, quite often in correlation with uh, access to derivatives clearing houses, which you know, we were already providing. Um, I think the odds are out again and to the level of collateral that will be needed in the future. Let's realize that today most collateral is still cash. So what will be the remainder that will be mobilized is still, uh, is still a question. EMIR has unintended consequences as well uh, for us as market participants because, um, in fact, first it goes much beyond than the OTC space. Uh, you know, it covers the whole spectrum of instruments. And uh, it has created some extraterritorial effects whereby uh, non-European uh, central counterparties actually had to register with ESMA. And actually, us as a market participant, being European-based, uh, we, 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 uh, you know, we took a keen interest, obviously, in non-EU infrastructures depositing their, uh, uh, their, their, their files you know, by the 15th of September so that we could keep operating on such infrastructures. So that's, you know, an interesting development uh, from EMEA whereby, you know, uh, non-European CCPs had to register in, in Europe so that, you know, European participants could still remain members. So you can argue whether this is, uh, you know, fostering uh, more integration or actually uh, creating maybe potentially uh, more barriers. So we, we hope that uh, CSDR will actually not bring about uh, similar developments. Um, second topic would, will be certainly uh, coming forward, uh, you know, the, all the debate about uh, recovery resolution of market infrastructures. As, uh, as a significant bank, we have already, you know, done a lot on working on our own resolution plans uh, throughout the group, including our business, with really a way to uh, managing um, the continuity of operations. And I think we've had very intensive dialogue with our regulators uh, as supervisors ab about this, and we have, I would say we've been pretty much ahead of the pack on this topic. Uh, the question now moving on to market infrastructures will be, um, well, what does it mean, recovery and resolution for market infrastructures? Um, 
you know, shouldn't they already in their risk principle be, uh, you know, covered enough so that they do not expose themselves to the risk of uh, a failure? I think mean, that should be a key question. And second, is it for market participants to bail them out? Uh, especially when they venture into, uh, you know, we, what we could say innovative solutions, but which is also risk-taking activities. Um, so I think that's uh, an open question for the, for the market and surely for market participants to, to, to engage uh, and, and make sure that, uh, you know, eventually it doesn't all fall back on, on us as market participants because what it will bring is only further additional requests for, for capital and surely more cost altogether. So, to conclude, I would say much progress surely being made in Europe on the basis of, uh, you know, the ECB initiative on Target 2 securities. Surely a very good complement to Target 2 on cash. And um, still a lot of uncertainties uh, on the regulatory front. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Gerard. Thank you, Daniela. Um, I mean, not that much in my capacity as a chair of CLS. Uh, we run a machine, uh, 5.3 trillion a day every day, and uh, the euro lag is the second lag. If you would like to have more information, look at the BIS report last week. The market is still growing, and there's also a lot of documentation available on the CLS website. Um, since 1999, when the uh, euro was introduced, the public sector has been crystal clear what to do or not to do as an industry. For we need to have one euro capital market. We need to remove all the barriers, Giovannini 1 and 2, some of you will remember, or participated, and since the crisis, of course, take care of uh, that there are no systemic risk in the, uh, in the money markets, but also in the capital markets at large. On the payment side, the messages have been crystal clear too. One currency, one set of payments, at least one European card scheme, uh, take care of innovative payments for web merchants and also reuse the mobiles also to initiate payments. If you analyze what happened the last 10, 10 years, um, my observation is there are two streams of thought in banks. One uh, is banks that really support the vision as expressed by the public sector, um, mostly also at CEO level, but sometimes a bit at departmental level. And there are also uh, banks that do not support the vision. I heard several times top dogs uh, talking about our customer, customers don't ask for this change. Maybe it's true. Uh, some customers never ask for the euro, but it is a, a reality in life. And also, even some very large banks uh, told me openly in many meetings, you are ruining my business case because you can make money out of fragmentation. That is also a reality of life. Um, looking back, uh, the customer side, I think we can conclude uh, they were not enough engaged. And it is not so much the fault of the banks. It has partly to do how the public sector is organized, but also how the different sections of the customer base are organized. Of course, the European Association of Corporate Treasures will claim we speak on behalf of the corporates, but my reality is that not all corporates feel that they are representative, represented by the ESAT or any other organization. So for the issuing institutions, for the asset managers, for the pension funds, and even more complex for the consumers and SMEs. The FMIs have, of course, to manage the challenges, but also the opportunities. Um, today, we still have many FMIs. If you look at the IATSHA, 25 clearinghouses, FESA, still 20 members, each uh, for the clearinghouses, for the CCP, still 22 members, and the European CCD Association still has 33 members. Not all Euro area, but look at the website. So oh, after all, after, since the introduction to the euro, a real consolidation of FMIs did not yet happen. Um, if you analyze the point of view of the CEO of a FMI, um, of course the CEO takes care um, for the service to the market participants, mostly the banks, taking care of the cost and taking care of the risk of, of the F, FMI. Uh, more and more, 
fMRIs are not in the core services anymore. I've seen a lot of data that uh, the value-added service of a ACA, CSD, CCP uh, on the revenue, sometimes it is more than 50% of the revenue stream of an fMI. So if we use the word fMI, we should be careful. Are we talking about the core or are we talking about a lot of other services who don't, that doesn't have to do anything with the core of the service, which is very important to understand uh, how we integrate. The CEO also has to deal with the board and the shareholders. The shareholders have to in approve the investments in the core and value-added services and also take care of investments in takeovers and on mergers. Uh, I notice concrete cases in the industry on the payment side, on the security side, that the same firms behave as customer like X, have a vision supported by A and B for the payments and the security, but behave absolutely inconsistent as a shareholder. They vote in favor of, well, a solution, a way forward, which is not consistent with the vision. And the CEO, last but not least, uh, also defends its own position of the company. Uh, every CEO of every FM, FMI will sing the song of the vision. Uh, however, they all like to grow. They don't want to be trapped in an M&A game. And they also want to control the rule books. And the rule books are really critical for the industry. And I never understood why on the security side, the members and the shareholders let allow that the rule books are not in, in control of the members anymore. And some of the institutions are, of course, listed at, at stock exchanges making money for the shareholders too. So I think if you compare the payment and the security side, uh, of course, we always need a clear vision. For the payment side, uh, for the euro area, it was in the end formulated in the white paper of 202. There was a clear ownership of the banks uh, and absolutely support of the public sector in Brussels and Frankfurt. Uh, also at the level of Mr. Trichet at the time and Charlie Mc Mc McCreevy. In the end, the body was created, the European Payment Council. The same banks, or nearly the same banks, there were some American banks also included in the securities deb debate at, at the time. We talked in, in the talk shop, uh, the European Securities Forum, which was really a forum, a talking club, and the same banks were not prepared to create the European Securities Council. So a decision-making body for the securities industry. And I remember that the CEOs in the end uh, were asked to come to Mr. McCreevy to take care. If you do not fix this problem in the securities industry, we will fix it uh, for you by regulation. And that led, of course, to the four recommendations of which one of them, interoperability, interoperability well, this never become a reality with some exception. So the support of the vision, it's a complex issue. We have to deal with a multi-country integration. It's a public sector and private sector. It is European and domestic level, the supply and the buy side. And uh, the supply and the buy side need absolutely both to be engaged, otherwise it will not fly and we will create problems at the end of the tunnel, which happened in particular also for the CEPA program. Um, and of course, a movement like that needs leaders on the public sector side and on the private sector side. There are strong and weak examples during the route we had the last 10, 10 years. That's crystal clear. So probably the way forward is, can we uh, upgrade the vision from a buy side perspective, sell side perspective for the securities and the, in and the payments industry? There are many open issues to solve from a customer perspective. For instance, they ask for e-payments, they ask for M-payments, they do not ask for an additional card scheme. However, the public sector is very clear, create at least one European card scheme. Um, also, for the securities business, are we really serious about recommendation three, supported by the industry, formulated by FASA, 
uh, each and the European CSD Association. If we are bloody serious, we need only one rule book for clearing with the, uh, with the standards, technical standards. We only need one rule book for the CSD, not multiple rule books with the same standards. And that means that we have to do something on the governance, on the public side and also on the private side, including the buy and the sell side, with support of the FMIs. I also noticed that a lot of problems was, were created of the non-alignment of the public sector. I'm feeling overall quite comfortable with the cooperation of the, 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 the private si sector with the ECB, but it was more complex to deal with inside Brussels. We had serious and have still serious debate with our friends of competition. What is more com more important, competition or cooperation in the industry. So that's why the issue of rule books is so important. We need to compete in the services to our customers. We need to cooperate on the level of rule books and standards. And we need to allow that there are competing FMIs, but with the same rule books. Thank you very much, Gerd. I think you have also been a bit provocative. But for reason of time, I would like now to open immediately the floor to the audience, because if not, there would be no, not enough time to take questions. So I would suggest that we take two, three questions, and then we try to answer to the three, just as a way to optimize the time. So I would, would like to... <laughs> okay. <laughs> there were two candidates, so go for it, okay. <laughs> Please. Thank you very much, um, Gottfried Witz, and, and a bit like Gerard, this time I speak as chairman of the European Ripper Council. Um, you know, it, I hear a lot of good noise, things are moving to the right direction, but I fully agree with Gerard that there's more work to be done. So can anybody in the panel comment on what's missing? We have target to cash, we have target to securities, we have uh, T plus two coming, we have a lot of regulation. Are there missing things to come to this European capital market? The second question is uh, triggered by uh, Paul's comments on you know, the fines for uh, fails of settlement. I always said that fines for fails doesn't solve the issue. So uh, we have mandatory buy-in, for instance. Is that helpful or is it gonna, could be wor making the situation worse in the future? Thank you. Are there other questions? Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Roger Storm I'm from EBA Clearing. This question to uh, Sophie Gauthier. You mentioned the impressive number of clearing houses and CCPs, etc., that you were taking part of. How concerned are you about the amount of assets you tie up in each one of these and, and what's happening with those going forward? Thank you. Maybe a final question? Okay, if not, uh, we give the floor to the... Maybe we start with Sophie, since one question was addressed to her, but then uh, the question of Goffrey, I think, is for the whole panel. So, please. I mean, it's, it's clear that, uh, you know, the, the recent evolution of uh, banking rules uh, is, is pushing, is forcing members and clearing members, as we are, to allocate more capital, you know, to... Uh, I mean, the irony that we are... Obviously, we are using increasingly central counterparties. We still see new markets uh, bringing central counterparties about, like Spain, for example. And um, uh, in fact, now the, the, the view of the banking regulators is, is to suggest that because these infrastructures are concentrating risks, we as participants should allocate more capital because we are members. Uh, so, uh, as a result, I mean, for us, for sure, it's, uh, it's resulted in a very significant impact of uh, allocated capital. That, that's, that's very clear. And I guess all uh, clearing members are very much uh, in the same situation. Um, for us, it's, it's actually quite significant. It's, uh, you know, in proportion of uh, almost half of the capital already allocated to our total business. So when you look at the proportion of the clearing activity 
versus you know, the total, total book, it's, it's actually very, very significant. Hence the question, you know, where is it going to go next, uh, especially if uh, the view taken by, the, uh, uh, by the, the regulators would be that it's again for all participants to, to bail out these such infrastructures. So for sure, it, this is, it is a real concern, and that's why I believe it's important that the industry also <laughs> mobilizes. Totally share uh, Gerard's view on you know, the need for rule books. It's clear that infrastructures can compete on, on risks or uh, risk-taking activities. And then is it for us, again, to, to bail them out? So for us, no, for sure, it is, uh, it is a significant um, aspect. Maybe c coming back to, to, uh, to Gottfried's question about what is missing, um, what I would suggest maybe is to take a transversal view at the cumulative impact of all the regulation, because we see maybe some level of cont potential contradiction in, in what is being, is being done, and also take a long-term view on the impact of you know, what, it, what it's about. Um, you know, if you look at, if you take the long-term, I mean, the long-term perspective on uh, economic growth, what you need are thriving equity capital markets. You know, uh, bonds for sure, and you know we are talking a lot uh, in increasing access of small, medium uh, companies or mid caps to, to the bond market as well, as, as a way to refinance. And there's a, a call even from the European Central Bank that more of the financing would move to, to the capital markets. Now, for this, you you want to make sure that uh, we are not creating new rules that will just uh, prevent uh, these markets from uh, just operating. And I would just name one, which is uh, the final tr financial transaction tax in, uh, in Europe, which um, you know, I think would defeat the whole purpose. Uh, we, we can also quote the leverage ratio, which again uh, uh, would probably uh, you know, prevent banks even from taking more deposits when uh, liquidity rules are supposed to, to, to make balance sheet more liquid. So I would say you know, look at the cumulative impact of all this regulation and make sure that we can have a capital market that develops uh, going forward. If you take just France and Italy, the impact of the introduction of the taxes, which is more, I would say, more lenient than even what is contemplated at European level, but has already been a, a dramatic impact on um, the volumes uh, in, in the market, uh, both, you know, in both markets. So I would rather suggest take a step, look at the cumulative impact, and maybe avoid from uh, taking some unnecessary steps forward. Before I give the floor to the others, uh, let me disagree with what you say that uh, the new regulation that push for uh, uh, moving transaction to financial market infrastructure and increase the resilience of infrastructure, increase the cost for bank for risk management. If you move a position from one to another, you don't increase. You just transfer and maybe modify the liability structure, but it's not obvious that we, you increase. There is one case where you increase. If you were not managing the risk properly, then if there was no collateral because you were taking risk with no measure to address the risk, then of course, then the cost is increased, but it's also because it increased the safety. So there is a trade-off. So I may agree that uh, more in the way Paul has put the issue that you may need to assess the impact, that this will lead to change in liability structure, but in principle, is not moving the infrastructure that will increase the cost for addressing the risk, unless the, the risk before was not addressed properly. In this case, I think we should welcome the fact that the cost has increased, because this means more safety, more certainty, and less disruptive consequence in case of a major stress situation. I'm a supporter of infrastructure, so I can be biased, but uh, I feel that I need to defend. I also feel that paradoxically, if risks are properly managed today, bringing to the infrastructure and concentrating will reduce the cost for risk, because we'll reduce the exposure if uh, the arrangements are uh, legally sound, and may even bring to some uh, benefit. Now, I feel that, that in principle there will be an increase because we have raised the bar, but this is irrespective of whether the risk is managed in the infrastructure or in the bank. There was a crisis. There was evidence that uh, in presence of certain stress situations, risk cannot be properly managed, and regulators have raised the bar. But this is not a problem of infrastructure or uh, keeping the transaction bilateral. It's not keeping the transaction bilateral outside of the infrastructure that will reduce the cost. So 
uh, I feel this is something where we should be a bit careful because I, I don't accept the fact that... Uh, I think the point is not going on CCP or not going on CCP because, I mean, definitely the move is, is towards uh, pushing more transactions towards CCPs. The, the question is more, how will the CCPs manage their risks? And then what is the, you know, the impact on uh, uh, members you know, in terms of capital allocation, as we were mentioning, and you know, recovery resolution plans? I think that's more the question. Paul. Um, I feel a bit nervous sat here at the moment between that disagreement. Um, uh, maybe, between, maybe, yeah? maybe I'll go back to the original <laughs> question. The women, um, Godfrey's question. I'll be, I'll be brief. Godfrey's question, what more needs to be done? My first reaction is to say, please save us from more initiatives. I mean, we're, we're, we're struggling with the ones we've got already. But leaving the flippancy to one side, I think there is one thing that we, we, we haven't got right in Europe yet. Um, and that's dealing with the whole question of conflict of law resolution and uh, securities law harmonization. It's been on the agenda for the EU Commission uh, for years. Um, I think it's absolutely core to, to examine and get right when you're looking at cross-border movements of, of, of collateral. Uh, and when within the EU you've got so many different legal regimes that apply. Um, it's complex, it'll take years, um, but the fact the process hasn't really started yet uh, I think is, 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 is a shame given how much progress has been made with everything else. Godfrey's second question was about um, sort of should you be buying in uh, or fining, in a mandatory sense, all transactions, including, I guess, Godfrey uh, repos and other activities? The answer is clearly no. You should not be taking a view in, in a legislative level on a, a blanket fining buy-in regime. Um, you should be given discretion to regulators based on empirical evidence of what those regimes would do to market liquidity and market efficiency. And I'm optimistic that from the current text, the CSD regulation will end up with a bit more analysis being done by the regulators before it's applied. Um, but clearly, a, bank, a blanket rule like that would have a massive disruption and would no doubt uh, ruin many of the initiatives that have already been put in place. Thank you. <coughs> Matthias. I think there's nothing to add when it comes down to the settlement discipline topic. But when we look into what's missing, I think it's the effective implementation. We are very good in terms of doing concepts as an industry. We're very good at coming up with recommendations. Um, but what's lacking is the actual implementation. And I think from, a, from an EU point of view, we have quite a unique chance with, with T2S being a facilitator, being a trigger point in order to make parts of harmonization becoming effective. And um, in that context, it's, it's, it's really to come up with a clear roadmap of how that implementation and which of these areas uh, should be done and um, how that can be put on a timeline. Uh, because if we all wait until the last piece has been defined and has been agreed upon, we will never get harmonization done. And it's not always very complex. Uh, we, I've mentioned before that parts are missing in terms of, for example, taxation. If you talk about tax, everything, everyone believes, oh, that is complex, that is diversified, that is an area that you better not touch. But at the end of the day, it's pretty pragmatic. In Europe, in order to benefit from, from taxation in, in the various countries and the taxation regimes, you have to create or you have to provide as a beneficial owner a certification of residence. But it looks different in every country. And it's not that difficult to put a name and an address in a unified form in the EU in order to provide that. And that is a very practical step of harmonization. Don't ask me why we can't agree on it, even from a public sector point of view. But uh, it shouldn't be that difficult. And it would give a tremendous effect. Yeah. Yeah. From my perspective, what is missing, um, I believe you need a stronger body for the uh, successor of the SEPA Council. Uh, it was a good step forward. Governance is very important, engaging the buy side and the sell side, and Brussels and Frankfurt. So I know that Brussels is working hard on it in cooperation with the ECB, but that's what we need. But at the same time, governance in the securities industry, we had an attempt 10 years ago, and it's also weak. If you want to have to reach a common objective, you need also a strong body. We, Gottfried, we were together in the Giovannini dia dialogues extensively, but in the end, the industry itself uh, did not achieve to do it by self-regulation. So we should not uh, 
have a mixed feeling about the intervention of the public sector. The message was clearly given at the time by the commissioner, and we were not able to get our act together like we did in the payment industry, although there are also flaws. The second point, what is missing, maybe the public sector should be more aligned and more precise what has to, do, to be done when. Uh, because there are so many voices, even out of Brussels and or Frankfurt, uh, that should be very precise, otherwise you don't achieve anything. Thank you. I think if uh, I can briefly summarize uh, the, the discussion. First of all, I have to say that uh, I see more challenges than opportunities. I don't know if this is pessimism from uh, the panel or prudence simply. <laughs> or intention to, to hide the business strategy. But uh, say I have collected the number of concerns that were put under impact of regulation, and uh, only one could be an opportunity, more business to FMI. As uh, Paul has said, there, are, there is now compulsory clearing, there is a compulsory reporting to trade repository, and Amir introduced the obligation for CCP to keep collateral on the CSD. That is also something that will uh, bring more business to, be, to FMI. But on the other end, uh, uh, impact on customers is a challenge because it's still unclear what does it mean in terms of uh, a highly cost, uh, different liability structure. There is an issue of global consistency in regulation and uh, implementation because uh, several stream of uh, regulation have taken place at global level, but also at national level. In particular, we know that TESMA is working hard on uh, equivalence between EU and uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, there are also some concern that uh, some specific provisions that are under CSDR on settlement discipline or EMIR uh, registration among European CCP may unduly complicate a situation that is already complex and uh, fragmented. Uh, there has been uh, acknowledgement that some regional solutions have been developed, and uh, in this respect, I would like to say that maybe the only real case where we have reduced the number of, of uh, infrastructure has been Target 2, because Target 2 has really replaced the national RTGS with a single platform. So, so far, at least one result, but as uh, Sophie said, maybe it's not a coincidence that, that came from the public sector. And this gives me a good floor, uh, the, occasion to introduce the third issue that uh, Gerard has mentioned that I think is very important, that is governance. I'm very grateful that you mentioned governance because it's really, really relevant for all uh, the area, both for payment, for, both for securities and uh, for CCP. And uh, it's clearly an issue that has been uh, a drawback for uh, realizing further integration. And as Sophie said, maybe it's not the case that now the second major initiative for integration is T2S, where again the problem of governance has been overcome because it comes from the public sector. Uh, on what we are missing, uh, we had uh, four uh, indications by the four panelists, so I think it's very nice. The first is to have uh, an holistic approach in order to have uh, an uh, overall uh, evaluation of the impact of regulation, and this I think is important, especially because as, uh, as noted in the challenges, regulation is fragmented, so we don't have a single piece. We have to look at a lot of uh, pieces that then will come together when uh, the infrastructure will go to operate in the market. There is maybe an issue to give uh, more uh, attention to some additional legal issues that uh, may arise on the, on the one hand because of uh, the growing importance of uh, globalization but on the other hand also because the recent legislation has created or has tried to address a new issue, there are all the problem of the by side that now is forced to central clearing and directly that need to be looked at. There is a problem of implementation and there is the problem of having soon the successor for the SEPA Council in order to move on the work in the field of retail payments that is important. On my side, I just would like one issue that has not been mentioned, but I think is important, that is uh, transparency. So there is also a need to increase uh, transparency. The, this work has started with the, the reporting requirement for trade repository, but there are segments of the market where there is no reporting requirements at the moment, where transparency can be increased. And there is also a need in this field to have a global consistency 
among the different initiatives because having the separate trade repository that uh, work with different data, different criteria for aggregation will not necessarily give the transparency that the legislator intended to introduce when asked for reporting trades to the trade repository. And this, uh, I would like to say that there are some stream of work of the FSB that are working on this, and one is chaired by Mr. Curet that is looking at uh, global aggregation of data for uh, uh, OTC derivatives trade repository, and another one that is uh, co-chaired by me and the Federal Reserve that is about uh, possible uh, aggregation of data concerning uh, repo market and securities lending. I think we've been a bit longer than expected, but the discussion has been very interesting, so I would like to thank once again the panelists for the good remarks, and thank you very much to everyone.